latent space is this mysterious universe that neural networks learn and store information in. It is not well defined. It is often beyond humans or even other AI models to directly interpret. And yet, it is a key concept underlying almost all deep learning models ever trained. How are they formed? What can be done with it? And how much can we really understand it? Today we are discussing all of that and for some practical demonstrations, we are going to train a variational autoencoder network to generate people's faces and explore how the latent space can be explored to not only gain key insights about our trained model, but also the real world data set it was trained on. So suppose I say the word Tom Cruise. So you got an image in your head, right? It's like this voodoo magic. But between my saying the word and that image popping up in your mind, that involuntary, inaccessible, intermediate state is basically the latent space. The human brain does some pretty heavy stuff, which frankly, I don't understand. But there's this thing called the hippocampus in our brain that allows us to seamlessly input new information and consolidate it into our long-term memory. And neural networks are not that different in that kind. Much like us, they input whatever signal they are provided with, visual, audio, text, a mixture of everything, and they internally map each of these inputs into a specific representation that only it understands. Imagine a 2D blank canvas, which is the mind of the neural network that has been trained to learn faces of celebrities. It maps every face it sees to a specific coordinate in this canvas. Things that are similar or highly correlated will get mapped to a similar region, allowing the model to form its own hidden understanding or representation of each area of this canvas. In practice, however, most neural networks are trained on a much higher dimensionality than 2D. Each image gets transformed into an array of numbers that is used to represent the input image. This is called an embedding. Now the next logical question is how are these embeddings even created inside neural networks? And one of the most classic training approaches is the autoencoder. Here's how that works. We take our image, pass it through a multi-layer neural network called the encoder that compresses it into a much smaller flat vector. And then another network called the decoder reconstruct the original image from this compressed state. There's an old saying in the ML community, compression is intelligence. An intelligent encoder will know which details to discard and which details to retain so that the decoder is able to reconstruct this image with minimal loss of information. One common way people use embeddings other than compression is to do nearest neighbor or reverse image search. For example, here I've trained an autoencoder on a dataset of celebrity faces and generated the latent embeddings of all images in the database. The latent embedding is generated simply by passing the input image through the encoder and retrieving the compressed representation. Now I can input a new image and find the K most similar image from the database of latent embeddings. I can also do fancy visualizations like this one where I run a dimensionality reduction algorithm like UMAP or TSNI on the latent embeddings to convert them into 2D points and plot them here. As you can see, certain sections of this 2D map contains images of women, certain sections of men, and not just that, the spatial layout of these clusters also have meaning. For example, if you go from left to right in this image, you'll see that the image slowly turn their heads from left to right. And in the lower part of the plot too, notice how the right side contains images of men, and as we go to the left, it contains images of women. The autoencoder doesn't enforce the neural network to learn specific layouts. It just asks it to compress and uncompress the data. And in doing that, the network automatically learns all these crazy relations and correlations in the data that we ourselves may not know a priori. While digging at what the latent space looks like is fun, but there's not many real world use cases for it. Uh, it's like having a key but not knowing what it unlocks. To evaluate the quality of latent space, we may want to generate something like an image or text from the latent space and then examine the generated content. That is what a variational autoencoder does. I'm not going to dive deep into the details about it in this video, but in a nutshell, while the original autoencoder model just trains the model to reconstruct input images from the latent space, VAE adds another loss to the structure itself of the latent space. 
by shaping it to a known distribution like a Gaussian. And after the model is trained, to generate a new image, we can now sample a new random vector from a Gaussian distribution and then pass it through the decoder part of the network. And lo and behold, it will generate a new image from this random input. Here I've trained a variation of the variation autoencoder called the DFCVAE, which replaces the straight up reconstruction loss with the auxiliary loss between the feature maps of a pre-trained computer vision model like the VGG. I'll add a link to the paper in the description below if you guys are interested. With that, you can generate new faces by feeding vectors sample from Gaussian distribution. But this is not just a random image generator. And you can do more cool stuff like image space interpolation. You take two latent vectors that produce two different faces and then calculate the intermediate vectors in between to produce intermediate images that slowly interpolate between the two. Uh, here are some examples. Feel free to pause and have a look. So far, everything I've shown is purely learned from images. But what if the images have additional metadata information? Thankfully, the Celeb A data set that I use to train these models do have a bunch of additional attributes for each image, like their gender, facial hair, eyeglasses, smiling. We can do some pretty cool stuff with these information as well. For example, we can take some smiling faces from our data set, compute their embeddings, and average them to get an average smiling face embedding. We calculate the average embedding of a handful of non-smiling faces as well. And finally, we can subtract the first vector from the second vector, and whatever remains is a vector representation of the smiling attribute. Now we can take a non-smiling image, calculate its latent embedding through our trained encoder, add the smiling vector in the latent space itself, and decode it back. And voila, we have a similar image, but with a smile. Uh, this is called latent space arithmetic where we combine different attribute vectors to the image embeddings and we manipulate the image in the latent space and the decoder adjusts to these manipulations by responding accordingly. Now again, it's worth reiterating that we did not explicitly use these attributes while we were training the variational autoencoder. We trained the variational autoencoder simply on the images in an unsupervised way, but we used these attributes after the model is trained to find those fuzzy attribute vectors and then we used it to do random stuff like this. And there's another thing that I will show before wrapping up this video. And that is about finding patterns and trends in your data. Suppose you didn't have all the attributes that come with the Celebe data set. Can you still extract meaningful insights from the data? Yes, in the latent representation, you can run a dimensionality reduction algorithm like PCA to extract the principal components from the latent space. The components returned by PCA represents the vectors to explain the maximum variance in the data. The components are also ordered according to how much variance it captures so the first component captures the maximum variance and the second one after that. Here I have run PC on the latent embeddings and extracted the top 10 principal components. Again, by doing vector arithmetic as before, I can add or subtract these component vectors from the generated image to manipulate the images in the latent space even further. For example, the first component seems to be about capturing which direction the person is facing. And the second component is capturing if it's male or female. Another one captures if they are smiling or not. So this basically tells us a little bit about our data set, like what kind of variations dominate the original data that the model was trained on. For example, just by visualizing the principal components extracted from the latent space, we can answer many demographic questions like which race, age, and genders dominate our data set without having to manually look at individual image one by one and not having access to any annotations. So we covered a lot already, and I think I'm going to draw a line here for this video. There's still so much to discuss about this topic. In my last video, I described a new technique that trains latent space models without pixel-to-pixel -pixel image reconstruction methods. And I've also done a pretty loaded video on multimodal machine learning where we combine inputs of multiple modalities like images, text, and audio to train a joint latent space. Feel free to browse through the channel to see what you like and do share this video and please consider subscribing if you like this video. You're magnificent.